The beginning of photography started almost 200 years ago, when the first prototype of a camera was developed. Photographic history has advanced from crude photos to the high-tech mini-computers found in today's smartphones. But still, looking back, there was a lot of really outrageous stuff photographed over time. 20 weird old photos you definitely have to see. Vintage Hair Dryer Blow dryers were invented in the late 19th century. The first model was created by Beau Godfrey in his salon in France in 1890. His invention was a large seated version that consisted of a bonnet attached to the chimney pipe of a gas stove. It was not portable or handheld and it could only be used by having the person sit underneath it. Around 1915, hair dryers began to go on the market in handheld form. However, the early handheld dryers had a fatal flaw, literally, in their tendency to electrocute the user. The alternative, other than using a towel, was to visit a hair salon and utilize what can only be described as a hair drying device or a helmet. The 1950s also saw the introduction of the rigid hood hair dryer, which is the type most frequently seen in salons. In the 1970s, the US Consumer Product Safety Commission set up guidelines that hair dryers had to meet to be considered safe to manufacture. Since 1991, the CPSC has mandated that all hair dryers must be using a ground fault circuit interrupter so that it cannot electrocute a person if it gets wet. By 2000, deaths by blow dryers had dropped to fewer than four people a year, a stark difference between the hundreds of cases of electrocution accidents during the mid 20th century. Mail that baby. One of the most significant innovations of the early 20th century might be the post office's decision to start shipping large parcels and packages through the mail. When it officially began in 1913, the new service suddenly allowed millions of Americans great access to all kinds of goods and services. But almost immediately, it had some unintended consequences. Some parents tried to send their children through the mail. Just a few weeks after Parcel Post began, an Ohio couple mailed their eight-month-old son to his grandmother, who lived just a few miles away. The baby was just shy of the 11-pound weight limit for packages sent via parcel post, and his delivery cost his parents only 15 cents in postage, although they did insure him for $50. And in the next few years, stories about children being mailed through rural routes would crop up from time to time. But while the odd practice of sometimes slipping kids into the mail might be seen as incompetence or negligence on the part of mail carriers, historians see it more as an example of just how much rural communities relied on and trusted local postal workers. Luckily, there are more travel options for children these days than pinning some postage to their shirts and sending them off with the mailman, maybe attaching a fragile sticker just to be on the safe side. Whiskey from a vending machine. Since the late 1880s and well into the 20th century, vending machines were all the rage. You could get everything from a TV dinner, cigarettes, to pantyhose, to something called stewed steak. Yum. If it could fit inside, it could be vended, which is how we got to the whiskey vending machine. Looking not much different than modern-day automatic coffee dispensers, the whiskey vending machine was first exhibited in London in 1960, and the concept was pretty simple. Put money in, get whiskey out. From the look of the machine, you could either get straight whiskey or a mixture of whiskey and soda. A button instructs you to make your selection first and wait for the green light before removing your cup. And its legacy continues today. Vending machines are a common sight in Japan, for example. There are more than 5.5 million machines installed throughout the nation. And Japan holds the highest ratio of machines per person for any country, with one machine for every 23 people. Regarding the development of advanced technology, modern vending machines provide more services by selling different kinds of products. Food, smartphones, and even clothing can be found in these machines. The Wildman Suit You cannot imagine a hunter wearing this suit and running around in the forest effortlessly. However, if you are a hunter yourself, then you will know the struggle of blending in the wild and moving without making any noise. Both sound impossible with this so-called Siberian bear hunting suit from the 1800s. It includes a leather jacket, pants, and an iron helmet. Not to mention the layer of one-inch iron nails coming out of the suit. 
The nails are held in place by a second layer of leather lining the whole thing and quilted into place between the nails. Fans of historical curiosities have marveled at this bizarre, even sinister looking costume. Conclusive evidence is not available as to the precise origins of the costume, although it is a real historical artifact, and the widely shared photograph of it is authentic. As of 2021, the suit itself was housed in a Houston, Texas museum that contains the private art and artifact collection as part of a surrealist exhibit. We've seen some deranged vintage body armor before, but nothing as gutsy as this costume. Selling Mummies During the Victorian era of the 1800s, French military commander Napoleon's conquest of Egypt threw open the gates of Egypt's history for rich Europeans. At that time, mummies were not given the respect that they deserved, and in fact, mummies could actually be purchased from street vendors. The wealthy elite of the era would often hold mummy unwrapping parties, which, as the name suggests, had the main theme of which a mummy would be unwrapped in front of a crowd. During that period of time, the well-preserved remains of ancient Egyptians were routinely ground into a powder and consumed as a medical remedy. Yikes. It was so popular that pulverized mummies even instigated a counterfeit trade to meet demand, in which the flesh of homeless people was passed off as that of ancient mummified Egyptians. As the 19th century advanced, mummies became prized objects of display, and scores of them were purchased by wealthy European and American private collectors as tourist souvenirs. For those who could not afford a whole mummy, their body parts would be purchased on the black market and smuggled back home. Girls in the Windows In 1960, photojournalist Ormond Jigli assembled 43 women, dressed them in refined, colorful garb, and situated them in 41 windows across the facade of the classic New York City brownstones. Years later, the image ended up being his most famous artwork, and here's how the visionary photographer made it happen. He contacted the foreman of the building and convinced him to clear a two-hour period of time for him to work, and clear out the window jams. Then he reached out to a modeling agency that he had worked for and asked for models to volunteer to be in his dream picture. They were to wear what they wanted and show up over the lunch hour, since the building had been gutted for electricity and gas. There was a gaping hole on the sidewalk, so unafraid to ask a favor, he contacted the city and asked for permission for the Rolls Royce to be parked on the sidewalk for the time necessary to set up the picture. Jiggly then placed the models, including his wife, trying to loosely coordinate their outfits into the 30 windows. Some were bold enough to stand on the window jam and some were framed by the window. With three additional models, two on the street and one on the ground floor, the picture was complete. 137 year old man When you're 137 years old, you're bound to get a few wrinkles. According to the Chippewa people, eyewitness accounts, and Chief John Smith himself, he was 137 when he died, putting his birth year at 1785. In fact, the Chippewa people refer to him as Ga Be Na Gun Wants, which translates roughly to wrinkled meat. The nickname probably came from his face's wrinkled leathery appearance, famous for miles around. There's no doubt that his age is highly contested. However, no one has ever been able to figure out exactly when John Smith was born. Chief John Smith lived his entire life in the Cass Lake area of Minnesota and had eight wives and no children, except for an adopted son. Local photographers used him as a model for numerous stylized images, including life, which were widely distributed as cabinet photos and postcards. Smith was known to travel for free on the trains running through the reservation, selling his photos to passengers and becoming something of an attraction or celebrity. The Isolator We live in a time when our attention span seems to get shorter and shorter, so maybe a device like this would come in handy. The Isolator, a bizarre and rather creepy helmet invented in 1925 by Hugo Gernsback, inventor, writer, editor, and magazine publisher. The purpose of the invention was simple. The wooden helmet blocked out sound and vision in order to help the wearer focus on whatever task they had in hand. The inventor claimed that the helmet reduced noise by up to 95%, and the tiny glass spy hole ensured that no amount of nearby movement could rouse the wearer from their work. 
To help eliminate visual distraction, the small piece of glass in front of the eyes on the helmet are painted black, with a thin line of paint scraped away, just enough to see a piece of paper directly in front of you. When he realized that people were getting sleepy under the hood, the inventor also added an oxygen tank. The only downside, of course, is that it made you look completely ridiculous. But at least the person inside it remained anonymous. However, we can't think of anything more distracting than working next to somebody wearing one of these. Boxing Kangaroo The image of the boxing kangaroo has been known since at least 1891, when a cartoon titled Jack the Fighting Kangaroo with Professor Lenderman appeared in the magazine Melbourne Punch. In the late 19th century, outback traveling shows featuring kangaroos wearing boxing gloves fighting against men. An 1895 German silent film and an English silent film in 1896 also both featured kangaroos boxing against men, while the American animated shorts The Boxing Kangaroo from 1920 and Mickey's Kangaroo from 1935 helped establish the concept of a boxing kangaroo as a popular culture cliché. The 1978 Hollywood movie Matilda featured a boxing kangaroo that was exploited for prize fighting. The idea of a boxing kangaroo originates from the animal defensive behavior, in which it will use its smaller four legs, its arms, to hold an attacker in place while using the claws on its larger hind legs to try to kick or slash them. The stance gives the impression that the kangaroo appears to be boxing with its attacker. The image of the boxing kangaroo, complete with boxing gloves, is one that dominates many people's perceptions of this iconic Australian animal. It's an enduring national symbol, featuring on Royal Australian Air Force planes during the Second World War, as well as being a popular national sporting symbol. Giant Manta Ray Manta rays are recognized by their large diamond-shaped body with elongated wing-like pectoral fins, ventrally placed gill slits, laterally placed eyes, and wide terminal mouths. According to reports, this gigantic manta ray is the biggest one ever captured, measuring a staggering 19 feet 9 inches from wingtip to wingtip and weighing over 5,000 pounds. That's right, on August 26, 1933, this monster ray became entangled in the anchor rope of Captain A. L. Kahn's fishing boat off the shore of New Jersey. Believe it or not, a baby manta held in the hands of Captain Kahn was born shortly after its mother fish was dragged ashore. The gigantic oceanic manta ray is the largest type of ray in the world, reaching widths of up to 29 feet. The manta rays are much larger than any other ray species found worldwide in tropical, subtropical, and temperate waters. Giant mantas are known to undergo long migrations and may visit cooler waters for short periods of the year. Although giant mantas are typically solitary animals, they do aggregate to feed and mate. The main threat to the giant manta ray is commercial fishing, with the species both targeted and caught as bycatch in a number of global fisheries throughout its range. And now it's time for our open discussion. The ancient Greeks told stories of giants, describing them as flesh and blood creatures who lived and died, and those whose bones could be found coming out of the ground, where they were buried long ago. Indeed, even today, large and surprisingly human-like bones can be found in Greece. According to Greek myth, the giants were the children of Uranus, the sky, and Gaia, the earth. Could there be some truth to the stories? This picture would indicate that giants are all too real. The unfolding discoveries of giant skeletons reported in America and other parts of the world have revealed a lost legacy of race of giants, who are now slowly starting to be included in the historical and archaeological record. Did they ever get this big? That's the question. Comment below with the hashtag open discussion. Thanksgiving was Halloween. The idea of people dressing up in costumes, playing tricks, and asking for treats sounds familiar. That's because the roots of modern-day Halloween lie in this forgotten American tradition. The Ragmuffin Day Parade Thought to have originated in immigrant neighborhoods in New York, Ragmuffin Day took off almost as soon as Abraham Lincoln declared Thanksgiving to be a national holiday in 1863. As with Halloween years later, the tradition became a time to experiment with and explore social taboos. Drag was particularly popular, with one report describing boys dancing to piano music and decking themselves out in worn-out finery of their sisters. 
Even some adults got in on the action, however, not everyone was thrilled with Rag Muffin Day. While most of the festivities were harmless, reports of bonfires and vandalism left New York City elites nervous. Local newspapers even began running an increasing number of articles and op-eds calling for an end to the wacky tradition. In 1956, New Yorkers celebrated the last recorded Rag Muffin Day in the Bronx. At that point, trick-or-treating had come to a mean something else and the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade gave Manhattanites a more regulated way to dress up and act out. Rolling Down the Niagara Falls Anna Annie Edison Taylor was an American school teacher who became the first person to survive a trip over Niagara Falls in a barrel. By 1900, Taylor had fallen upon hard times, having been burned out of her home and having lost money invested with a clergyman. Taylor believed that she needed money to hold her place in the world. Hoping to secure her later years financially, she decided she would be the first person to ride over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Taylor used a custom-made barrel for her trip, constructed of oak and iron and padded with a mattress. Two days before Taylor's own attempt, a domestic cat was sent over the Horseshoe Falls in her barrel to test its strength to see if the barrel would break or not. Not a very nice thing to do to the poor cat. However, the cat survived the plunge. On October 24, 1901, her 63rd birthday, the barrel was put over the side of the rowboat and Taylor climbed in along with her lucky heart-shaped pillow. After screwing down the lid, Taylor was set adrift and the river currents carried the barrel over the Canadian Horseshoe Falls. Rescuers reached her barrel shortly after the plunge. Taylor was discovered to be alive and relatively uninjured except for a small gash on her head. However, we definitely would not recommend doing something as dangerous as that. Aircraft Detection Acoustic location devices like the ones you see here were used by military services from mid-World War I to the early years of World War II for the detection of approaching enemy aircraft by listening for the noise of their engines. Before the invention of radar during World War II, incoming enemy warplanes were detected by listening with the aid of sound locators that looked more like musical instruments than tools of war. These radar forerunners, which earned the nicknames war tubas or sound trumpets, were first used during World War I by France and Britain to spot German Zeppelin airships. The first use of this type of equipment was claimed by Commander Alfred Rawlinson of the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve who in the autumn of 1916 was commanding a mobile aircraft battery on the east coast of England. He needed a means of locating zeppelins during cloudy conditions and improvised an apparatus from a pair of gramophone horns mounted on a rotating pole. Several of these types of equipment were able to give a fairly accurate fix on the approaching airships, allowing the guns to be directed at them despite being out of sight. Although no hits were obtained by this method, Rawlinson claimed to have forced a Zeppelin to jettison its bombs on one occasion. The first Ronald McDonald The McDonald's company started in 1940 as a restaurant that primarily specialized in barbecue, but eventually began to focus more on selling their most popular item, hamburgers. From there, they would eventually become the most successful hamburger chain restaurant in the world. In the 60s, however, as the company was still looking for ways to broaden its appeal and grow its size and scope, they realized the best way to continuously get new customers was to target the younger demographics. Enter the silly hamburger happy clown, aka Ronald McDonald. They decided to put a clown of their own on television, thus Ronald McDonald was born. A newly uncovered video has revealed Ronald McDonald as he made his 1963 debut and he looks distinctly creepy. With a drink cup for a nose and a food tray for a hat, the original Ronald resembles a scarecrow more than a clown. Made long before a new health-conscious generation prompted the sale of salads and juice beneath the golden arches, the commercial shows off the clown's prolific hamburger eating ability. He sports a special belt that magically produces three hamburgers in a row, and at the end of the clip, happily skips off to a McDonald's restaurant giant hippo harnessed. After considerable coaching at the hands of an animal trainer, Lotus, this circus hippopotamus was taught to haul a two-wheeled cart. A V-shaped tongue attached to a broad band around the creature's back and a bridle of strong leather with the reins attached to the jaws completed the harness and aided in directing the river horse. 
which seemed to enjoy its stunt as it walked to its pool and back. Hippopotamuses are large, round, water-loving animals that are native to Africa. The word hippopotamus comes from the Greek word for water horse or river horse, although hippos and horses aren't closely related. The closest living relatives to hippos are pigs, whales, and dolphins. But did you know that the hippopotamus is considered the world's deadliest large land mammal? These semi-aquatic giants kill an estimated 500 people per year in Africa, according to the reports. Hippos are highly aggressive and are well equipped to deliver considerable damage to anything that wanders into their territory. So training one must have been incredibly difficult. Holding hands. Nearly 200 years ago, Catholics marrying Protestants was considered controversial. In the Netherlands, this is the graves of a Catholic woman and her Protestant husband, who were not allowed to be buried together. In the Protestant part of this cemetery, J.W.C. Van Gorkum, Colonel of the Dutch Cavalry and Militia Commissioner in Limburg, is buried. His wife, Lady J.C.P.H. Van Afferden, is buried in the Catholic part. They were married in 1842. The lady was 22 and the colonel was 33. Despite the challenges they faced, Van Gorkum and Van Afferdeen remained devoted to each other and were often seen holding hands in public, regardless of the disapproving glances of those around them. After being married for 38 years, the colonel died in 1880 and was buried in the Protestant part of the cemetery against the wall. His wife died in 1888 and had decided not to be buried in the family tomb but on the other side of the wall, which was the closest she could get to her husband. In recent years, the gravesite has become a popular tourist attraction and a symbol of love and unity in the face of religious and cultural divisions. Many visitors leave flowers and notes at the graves, expressing their admiration for the couple's enduring devotion. Hard Drive on Plane this is a picture of an IBM hard drive being loaded onto an airplane in 1956. According to reports, it's a 5 megabyte drive, about the size of one song in today's standards. And it weighed more than 2,000 pounds. To put that into context, over 55 years later, the weakest iPhone 5S has a 16 gigabyte drive, about 3,200 times as big. It weighs a quarter of a pound. The IBM hard drive could have stored exactly one iPhone picture. Its design was motivated by the need for real-time accounting in business. The 350 stored 5 million characters. It had 50 24-inch diameter disks with 100 recording surfaces. Each surface had 100 tracks. The disk spun at 1200 rotations per minute. The data transfer rate was 8,800 characters per second. That's quite a big machine that really could do very little in comparison to today's hard drives. Walking your anteater. It seems very peculiar to see an anteater on a leash roaming the streets like a domesticated dog. Check out Spanish surrealist artist Salvador Dali taking his anteater for a walk in Paris in 1969. Dolly even brought an anteater with him as a special guest on the Dick Cavett show. But the real question here is not why does he have an anteater, but where did he get one? Eccentric, divisive, and visionary are just a few words to describe the Spanish artist. And it's hard to say if there are any number of words that could encapsulate his complex extravagance. With a colorful past and an extensive body of work, there's so much to learn about the surrealist painter. Scholars claim that he hated ants ever since he was a child and found them eating the dead body of his pet bat when he was a boy. This developed into his affinity for the anteater. Dinosphere The Dinosphere is a monowheel vehicle design patented in 1930 by John Archibald Purves from Taunton, Somerset, UK. Purves' idea for the vehicle was inspired by a sketch made by Leonardo da Vinci. Two prototypes were initially built, a smaller electrical model and one with a gasoline motor that attained either 2.5 or 6 horsepower, depending on the source consulted. Using a two-cylinder air-cooled Douglas engine with a three-speed gearbox also providing reverse. The Dynasphere model reached top speeds of 25 to 30 miles per hour. The gasoline-powered prototype was 10 feet high and built of iron latticework that weighed 1,000 pounds. The next generation version had 10 outer hoops, covered with a leather lining shaped to present a small profile to the ground. A novelty model was later constructed by Purves that could seat 8 passengers. 
the Dynasphere 8, made specifically for beach use. Herves was optimistic about his invention prospects, as reported in a 1932 Popular Science Magazine article. After a film test drive in 1932 on a beach in Weston, Supermare, Somerset, he stated that the Dynasphere reduced locomotion to the simplest possible form, with consequent economy of power, and that it was the high-speed vehicle of the future, feeding polar bears. This photo was taken during a routine military expedition in Chuki Peninsula, Soviet Union, a place so remote that there are usually more polar bears than people. The climate is very severe and sometimes the temperature falls below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. This causes the poor white bears and their cubs to start starving and freezing. The soldiers who served in the army district of Chukchi Peninsula didn't turn their backs on the poor and starving animals and started to feed them every now and then. Of course, most people did not have large amounts of meat at home to feed these animals, so the soldiers decided to feed the bears up with what they had in abundance tins of condensed milk. Those blue and white tins of condensed milk were the winter dessert staple of every Soviet kid. The condensed milk, because of its sugar content, had an indeterminately long shelf life, and there was always plenty of it. It was a common dessert in the army too. It isn't surprising to see it given away to bears, because unlike some stuff that was rationed, condensed milk in USSR was available in unlimited amounts.